Well, is it good to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. 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 Would you rather be in your own house? No. Yes. <laughs> I thought I'd throw that one just in case. One of the things that I've chosen to do at Easter time is to bring a message about the last seven words of Christ. Now, a lot of people say words. What do you mean the last seven words? And when in fact, it's not so much words, it's, it's a paraphrase or a, a statement, okay, a fact. And that's what we're looking at with Jesus. Um, all of those seven words or seven statements they are said from the cross. They are said from the cross. And you might think, how in the world could Jesus, when he was being tortured, and when he was being nailed to the cross, when he was being lifted up on that cross by his own weight, pulling down on those nails, those spikes, and then when that cross went right down into the hole and it just falls into that three or four foot hole and it just goes boom and it rattles his bones. It was from that cross that Jesus speaks to us. And not just to us. But there are certain parts where he speaks to people with him. And he also speaks to his father. So I want you to look with me. I'll give you some references. But the last seven words of Christ. And there's three parts to this. There are those concerns of Jesus for other people. You'll see that. I'll point that out to you. Also, there are those concerns for himself, for Christ. And then finally, those concerns, or that one concern that shows his obedience to his Father. So let's look at three, the first three, and those are the concerns for others. Those concerns <coughs> for others. He looked to the needs of others first. Now, what was going on with Jesus as he's being hung on the cross? What's going on? Well, there are soldiers gambling for his clothes. They are gambling for his clothes. Now, that's prophecy. That's prophecy. Now, how do I know? Well, Psalms 22, verse 18 tells about them gambling for his clothes. His concern then was for his enemies. His enemies. Those people who hung him there. Now, I am one who looks back and I say, okay, you hung Christ but you're not the ones responsible for why he's there. He was crucified because of the Jewish leaders and them coming to Pilate and basically forcing Pilate's hand to crucify Jesus Christ. There at the cross, Jesus is is hanging there and he says father forgive them for they know not what they do those soldiers had no idea why they were crucifying Jesus they were not part of the Sanhedrin they were not part of the Jewish council or anything like that but they were called upon, these soldiers, to nail these 
this man, along with two others, two criminals that, that deserved it, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And it says this in the scriptures that I've chosen. And two others also who were criminals were being led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him. Now that's a capital H, Jesus. They crucified him and the criminals, one on the right, one on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And they divided his clothes and they cast lots. Who was he referring to? In my opinion, he wasn't referring to the Jewish leaders and such. He was referring to those soldiers who were commanded by their commander to nail Jesus to the cross. They didn't know why. It was their job, their duty. And Jesus prayed for them. Now, do you remember what that, Jew, or that Roman official who stood there and condoned it all. He didn't have a choice whether or not they were going to crucify Jesus. He didn't have a choice of that. He just knew that he was called upon by his commander to crucify Jesus Christ. And what was it that he said? He said as he looked up at Jesus, and Jesus now was dead on the cross. We'll get to that in a minute. And he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. Amen. This man was innocent. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Secondly, his concern was for his family. In John 19, 25 through 27, it says this. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother, and the disciple he loved standing there, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. And then he said to the disciple, and that disciple is John. John, not John the Baptist. This was his, his best friend. John, the beloved disciple. He said, then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took Mary into his home. Did John have to do that? No. But he knew that Mary now does not have any support whatsoever in that lifestyle. Because a woman without a son to provide for her or a husband to provide for her, if that happens, she's going to die. Because society is not going to take care of her. And so Jesus took care of his mother. Why did he do that? Well, here's a very good reason. She gave birth to him. She carried him. And she cared for him. And she loved him. And Jesus said, Woman, here is your son. Here is your son. Pointing at John. That's the second word. And then 
Finally, the third thing in concern for others is concern for the needy. Truly, I say to you today, Jesus says, truly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Oh my. Who is he talking to? He's talking to one of those guys on who's being crucified just like him, nailed to the cross, and guilty of sin. Then one of the criminals hanging there, Luke 23, 39 through 43, then one of the criminals hanging there began to yell insults at Jesus. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuking him said, Don't you even fear God? Since you are undergoing the same punishment, we are punished justly. Hear that? This one criminal is standing up and he's saying, I'm guilty. He says, we are punished justly. In other words, he knew that they were condemned and that they were being crucified because of what they did against the laws of that area. We are being justly because we are getting back what we deserve for the things we did. But this man, this man, Jesus, has done nothing wrong. Now, how do we know that Jesus did nothing wrong. Because the Bible says that Jesus was absolutely innocent of any sin. That Jesus was innocent of any kind of burdens or whatever. The thing is this. <coughs> One of the things that I really, really appreciate about Jesus is the fact that because He was innocent of our of any sin, because He never did anything wrong, He was perfect. Perfect. But He died on the cross. There was a lot of people who didn't think He was very perfect. They, they tried to condemn Him. But they were all a bunch of liars. Yeah, liars. Do you know what a liar is? A liar is a sinner. Oh, wow. Anybody understand that? These guys were all sinners. Ooh, who else is a sinner? I'm a sinner. That's why I appreciate Jesus being perfect. You know why? Because Jesus was the only person who could go to the cross, die for my sins. I'm sure he died for yours too, but he died for my sins. He went to the cross for me. And he went to the cross for that criminal. That criminal. Who called out him by name. So when I when I when I look at the fact that Jesus was perfect and that he should have never been crucified because he was not guilty of anything. But he still went to the cross for our sins. Jesus died for me. And Jesus died for you. And he was the only one in all of mankind that could say, Here am I. Come to me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. And that's what I, I try to do is learn from him. That's why we have the Bible to learn from Him. Are we perfect? All those who are perfect, please stand. Now, yeah, see, we're all sinners, aren't we? 
But if I was to change that and say, all of you who are perfect, perfectly washed in the blood of Christ, I would hope all of us would say, I'm not going to ask you to stand because it might be someone who might get embarrassed. But he says, you are punished justly, or we are punished justly because we are getting back what we desire or what we deserve for the things we did. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then they said, Jesus, he said this. The man said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He must have been listening to Jesus. How would he know about the kingdom? And God who reigns. And he said to him, Jesus said to him, I assure you today, not tomorrow, not next year, not when you're 20. Oh, you're, you're dead. You're not going to be 20. I assure you today, you will be with me where? Yes. In where? Paradise. In paradise. <laughs> Where's paradise? Heaven. Heaven with God. Can you think of anywhere better than that? Brandon was talking about people who lived in the desert. Shirley and I lived in the desert. I pastored a church there for four years. It was fun. I enjoyed it until it got to be 130. Yeah. And then in the winter, it got down to like, oh, I don't know, negative two. Only once, though. <laughs> I couldn't have stood it any other time. But we close our eyes to this life and we open our eyes to the life with God. When do we do that? When we die. Yeah. That's the thing I like so much is the fact that I am going to heaven to be with Jesus. Why? Well, because I trusted Him for my sins and He took them away. Jesus concerned not just for others but for Himself. So the thing is this, when when, when we talk about his concern for others, he also had concerns for himself. He was very weak at this time now. You know, there's a fact that when he was carrying that, that, that cross, he's dragging it through the streets. And then finally it got to the point to where he finally just succumbed to the weight and he, and he fell. But he got up and he continued to carry it until someone came along and said, hey, I'll help you. Now, there are those who would say that that person probably was told to do so because Jesus couldn't take it anymore. I don't know. I don't think it's all that important. But Jesus was very tired. He was broken now. And he needed someone to help him. And he found someone. Jesus was lonely and fearful, full of fear. God had to turn away from His Son. Can you imagine the Son of God being forsaken by His dad when the dad just basically turned His head? Why did God turn His head on Jesus, His Son? Because, and I'm giving it to you straight out, because my sins, your sins, the world's sins are thrown all over him. And the father could not look at his son because now he has all these sins. But you know what's cool? When Jesus was put into the grave and when Jesus rose from the dead, he left all that dirty sin stuff in the ground. Did he come out a sinner? Full of sin still? No. <coughs> they were gone. Why? Because the Father, through his Son, who gave us forgiveness, left all that behind. And Jesus was raised once again 
not once again, but to be our, our Savior, our Redeemer. He was lonely at this time. The, the, the skies became dark. And God, and I think the skies became dark because the Father turned away from His Son. It says this, From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over the whole land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means what? My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? Dad, where are you? I need you. Well, he didn't say that, but I would have. The sins of mankind were coming upon Christ Jesus. Fourth. His physical needs, you see very well when it says, I thirst. Two words, I thirst. After this, Scripture says, John 19, 28-29, after this, when Jesus knew that everything was now accomplished, in other words, everything that Jesus was called to do. Everything that Jesus was called to fulfill was now done. It was done. After this, when Jesus knew that everything was now accomplished, that Scripture might be fulfilled, He said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine. Now, I'm not exactly sure what sour wine is. I'm not even sure how good wine is, to tell you the truth. My mom and dad had me drink one or two. I took a swallow and that was it. The thing is, I didn't care for wine. I didn't care for beer. I didn't care for anything that was alcoholic. That's just the way God made me. So I... I can't say that I, I, can, I, can, I can understand what sour wine is. I don't know. Someday you can tell me. A jar full of sour wine was sitting there. So he fixed, they fixed, they being the soldiers, they fixed a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop and held it up to his mouth. He, they held it up to his mouth. He was thirsty. That's pretty common, don't you think? He would be thirsty. He sweated heavily. And so they gave him sour wine. Second, or fifth, it says this. His concluding words his last thing to do is to bring obedience to the Father's will. He was going to fulfill everything that God wanted done by His Son. And this is what He said. It is finished. In other words, when Jesus was done with His job as the Redeemer and the Savior and the Son of God, when He was done, and now He's about ready to die there on the cross, He's been hanging there for hours, He says, it's finished. It's finished. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And then bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. He gave up his spirit. I want to move quickly now into the very last 
the seventh one. It's found in Luke 23, 44 through 46. And those verses say this. It was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land. Remember the darkness? Darkness came over the whole land until about three because the sun's light failed. The sun's light failed. The only way the sun's light is going to fail is if God intervenes. <clears throat> he could not look upon his son. Then his son said, Why have you forsaken me? Again, Luke 23, 44 through 46. It was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until about three. Because the sun's light failed, the curtain of the Sanhedrin was split down the middle. Now, do you know what it means to be split down the middle? It didn't start here and all the Roman soldiers came over. And by the way, the curtain was rather thick. Okay, it wasn't exactly like a sheet. Okay, it was thick. And it was rent from the top to the bottom, not from the bottom up to the top. God removed that curtain, that veil. <clears throat> Who else could have done it? Jesus was busy on the cross. He was dying. Only the Father could have rent that huge veil. He loved his son. But he still had to allow him to die. And Jesus called out with a loud voice. Father, into your hands I entrust my spirit. Now notice again, go back to the last one where it said he gave up his spirit. Well, this is him giving up his spirit. I entrust my spirit. Saying this, he breathed his last. He died. There on the cross with two criminals. But one of those criminals you will get to meet when you go to heaven. Amen. You won't get to meet the other one, but you will get to meet that one. And if you're wondering where he is, just ask around. <laughs> just ask around. And I'm sure you'll be able to find him. Father's will for the cross. The Father's will for Christ was to be the Savior of the world. I was thinking, Randall, about when we were talking about the world and that type of thing. And I was looking at the scriptures that Randall had us look at. And the world always represented the evil ones. The world always represented those people who were not, who were not a part of God's kingdom. Even in the old days, not a part. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Those three are all under one word evil. World, flesh, and devil. And we know enough about the devil, but sometimes we forget that the world is part of the devil. The world is where the devil thrives. And we don't want to survive in that type of world. We want to live 
under God's reign. With Jesus as our Savior. The Father's will for Christ was to be the Savior of the world. He is the Christ. And He paid the price for our sins. And we find that in the seven last words of Jesus. Because of Christ, we are redeemed. Now see, that's called balance. <laughs> it wasn't a dance, it was balance. Sometimes I get wobbly. Christ. Do you know Christ? Do you know Him as your Savior, as your Redeemer, as the one who loved you so much that He would die on the cross? But He didn't just die on the cross. Three days later, what happened? He kicked death in the head. He killed death for all those who ask for Jesus to come into their life. Have you ever asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins and make Him the Redeemer of your life? In other words, Jesus paid the price. Have you ever gone to the store to redeem something? Jesus paid the price for our sins. Do you know Him? This being Easter, you may have come just to hear some guy get up and talk. Well, I got up and I talked. But I'm not going to quit with just that. I'm going to ask you one more time. Have you ever asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins and know that He did. Notice, I said know that He did. Not, well, I hope so. No, you want to know. Know for a fact that Jesus forgave you of your sins and gave you a new life. A new life. And all that received Him, all those who received Him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God to them that call upon his name. Let's just bow our heads and pray. Father, we just praise your name. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to come on this Easter in this church with these people. I thank you for the opportunity you've given to me to talk about your son. We pray now, Father, for those who are just now beginning to receive Christ as their Savior. And I'm going to ask that with everybody's head down, eyes are shut, no one's looking around, you're being honest, I'm just going to ask you, with nobody looking around now, I'm going to ask you, have you ever asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins and you receive Him as your Savior? If you have done that, I'm going to ask you just to lift your hand up. That's all. Amen. Some people can't raise their hand. That's fine. That's fine. Go ahead and just lower your hands. But I want to pray for those who are not sure. Father, I thank you for this opportunity again. And now, Lord, I just pray for those who just aren't sure. Or maybe there are those who, yeah, they're pretty sure they have not done this. Lord, I would pray that they think very hard and choose your Son, Jesus, to be their Savior, their Redeemer, their Christ. And we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, Amen. Yeah.